We come before God now in our prayers of confession and of supplication. Let us all pray. O God, who knows the secrets of our hearts, we humbly confess before you our many sins and shortcomings, especially those by which we have grieved you in times past. We've not kept the vows we've made, we've yielded to temptation, and often we've forgotten you. Most merciful God, who has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities, we pray that you will forgive us. Make us glad according to the days wherein you have afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Incline our hearts henceforth to keep your commandments, and we pray that you will make us partakers of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Saviour of the world, who was named Jesus, according to the word of the angel, fulfil unto us, we pray, the gracious promise of that holy name. And of your great mercy, we pray that you will save their peop your people from their sins. And grant that as they have joy and peace in your name, they may labour abundantly to publish it unto all nations. To you who lives and reigns with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. And we further pray in the Lord words our Lord himself taught us to pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For in his kingdom, power and the glory. Amen. We come again now to sing to God's praise in the hymn, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Oh, 
come again uh, to read together from God's Word, and I invite you to read the responsive passages in italics as we read from the New Testament. And our Gospel lesson comes from John chapter 13. When Jesus had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. He commanded I give to you that you love my mother. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And Jesus said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow him now, but you will follow him now. And our epistle reading comes from Colossians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God, Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. Pray always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And of the love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before, three of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also been for the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard it, and you the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Baptists, our dear beloved servant. Through the faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, 
the whole that he made amongst your mouth in spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to praise for you, and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing uh, in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. For my God, and His blessing to all of those reading from His uh, holy word, and His name be the praise and the glory. All right, when we study Paul's epistles, the letters in the New Testament, we and I do draw your attention to the back of our Bible readings this morning, explaining um, about Colossae and what was going on and showing you where uh, Colossae, re or Colossae really is. It's 80... But, um, 80 miles or 80 metres? 80 miles, which is about nearly 100 metres from the coast. But when we study Paul's epistles, we see that each has a theme that stands out. They're written for a purpose. In Romans, Paul stresses and teaches and shows the importance and emphasises the importance of justification by faith. There's nothing that you or I can do concerning our salvation. It is all of grace. In Ephesians, it is the mystery of Christ and his church, of who Christ is and what he has done and what that means for our relationship with him. Paul explains in Ephesians the marriage relationship between husband and wife and then, of course, leads on to the relationship of Christ and his church. In Philippians, it is the joy which Christ brings, that no matter what is happening beyond us or outside of us or even within us, there is always Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, and that should cause us to rejoice, rejoice in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here in Colossians, it is the absolute supremacy and sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not need anything else. We do not need anyone else concerning our salvation. And we certainly should not be saying or trying to help God earn or get our salvation. Christ is sufficient. What Jesus has done on the cross, suffering and dying and rising again, that is what results in the forgiveness of sins and our salvation. We must never add or take anything away from what Christ has done. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, Paul says, continue to live in him, Colossians 2.6. And as we study Paul's letter to the Colossians, and, or as we look at the first 14 verses today, it is my prayer that our love for Christ will so grow that we'll only seek to do his will even more and ever walk faithfully in his way. Now, just a brief background um, to the book of Colossians and those who, um, were, who joined us on Tuesday for the online Bible study. Um, this will be a revision for you. But as I said before, Colossae was located about 80 miles inland from the city of Ephesus in the Lycus River, River Valley. And that Lycus River Valley was also important as it had a fair number, as it had a good population, who were reached by the church 
in Colossae. They were evangelized from the church in Colossae. Colossae was once a prominent town, um, but it, be, it became overshadowed by the towns nearby of um, Laodicea and Hierapolis. The scriptures reveal that as Paul was preaching in Ephesus, two visitors from Colossae became Christians, one of them being Epaphras and Philemon being another. Philemon later welcomed the Colossian church in his home, and Epaphras served as Paul's right hand man in evangelizing people in Colossae and also in the Lycus Valley. And so we have here a new thriving church. Paul, of course, continued to have a very deep interest in the church and prayerfully advised Epaphras and Philemon as was necessary. And so it was quite natural that when a major problem occurred in the church at Colossae, Epaphras came to Paul for help. Now remember that Paul at this time was in jail in Rome. And so the it had to be via correspondence. The problem came about because of a false teaching called Gnosticism. Gnostics considered themselves to be people of superior knowledge who could help lesser Christians become or attain deeper spirituality. In other words, they were saying it's not enough just to believe on Jesus and what Jesus has done. You've got to have this added knowledge which we have so that you can really become a true Christian. What that boils down to, of course, is the salvation by works, giving God a hand in helping him to save you. The Gnostics, with meaning people in the know, the spiritual elite who claimed to have all the elders, all the answers, held as their basic doctrine that matter, and that included the body, Anything physical, anything created, such as the world, was evil, and only the spirit was good. Now, that may sound rather complicated in the way it is, but what it boiled down to was that um, everything around them was evil, and therefore God could not have created the world, and Jesus, if he really was the Son of God, could not have come down being born as a baby, as a human body, because body is matter and matter is evil. And so to the Gnostics, Christ was not real and Christ was not enough to obtain salvation. And so the Gnostics came up with the religion where one could begin with Christ and then work one's way up by believing and doing various things. In other words, we are back to dabbling in salvation by works. The Gnostics, those in the know, looked down upon the simple Colossian believers, and they probably would have looked down upon all of us here. You know, um, we feel sorry for you. You don't have the knowledge. You don't have what we have. And uh, we want to help you, but in helping, they were in fact destroying the power of the gospel destroying justification by faith and in its in their place putting works people working towards their own salvation now this is the alarming message which Epaphras sent to Paul in prison Paul's brilliant answer was the letter to the Colossians which presented Christ as the creator and the all-sufficient Redeemer. And as I said before, in Jesus Christ, we have all that we need. In Jesus Christ, we have all that we need. We must never add to, we must never take anything away from what Christ has done for us on the cross. Paul's wise and masterful answer 
has served the church well through centuries as the church has repeatedly and continues to face similar heresies today. We around us are attacked by false teachers, by cultists who see Christ as only part of the answer, but not the all-sufficient one, who alone is the way to salvation and eternal security. And it all comes back to pride. Why can't I do something for my salvation? How dare God say, say that I'm not good enough to earn salvation? Come back to pride. And uh, when you read the book of Proverbs, which we're going through now, that pride is shown up to be a real enemy that prevents a true relationship, a true saving relationship um, with uh, the Heavenly Father through Jesus. But notice, notice that Paul, in writing to the church at Colossae, does not begin his letter saying what bad people you are. He doesn't come in with guns blazing, and he doesn't come in and attack the Colossian church right at the start for listening to this totally false teaching. First, Paul begins with the celebration of all that has happened to the church at Colossae before tackling the issue of these false teachers. A miracle had taken place in Colossae. A poor pagan people without God and without hope in this world had found the Lord Jesus Christ. Their lives had been changed. They had become a new creation. And some remarkable things had happened in the life of these people. And so let's celebrate with Paul. And it's I particularly chosen this today because uh, we'll be meeting later on and there's always that threat of doom and gloom. But um, we need to remember what Jesus has done for us and what um, this church is really all about and has been able to do how God has been able to bless us. Of course, there are challenges. Of course, we need to seek forgiveness for our sins, for our failures. But let's also celebrate um, what Jesus has done, celebrate our salvation in Christ. And that will be, um, I believe, a great stepping stone into the rest of this year. Firstly, there is Paul. Um, celebra celebrates joy, the celebration of joy, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God and Father. They, Paul, had never met the Colossians. We believe he never ever set foot in Colossae, he called them holy and faithful people in Christ. God's holy ones. They were set apart for the Lord God Almighty. They had been adopted into that eternal family, into God's everlasting kingdom. They were family. They were in Christ, which is the most joyous and rewarding place to be. The apostles celebrate that the Colossians and indeed all true believers had received the free gift of salvation and so rejoice in the wonderful promise of sins forgiven and in the absolute guarantee of eternal life. You may remember that Paul spoke to the church in, in, in Ephesus um, in the same way. There Paul also defined the church as being in Christ. In fact, in Christ is one of Paul's favourite phrase. Believers whom God has blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In fact, the first 14 verses of Ephesians use in Christ, or in him meaning in Christ, no less than 10 times to describe the overwhelming blessings and privileges of being born again, of being Christians, of belonging to the eternal family of God, of being adopted as sons and daughters 
into God's family. As believers, the Christians and Colossae were in Christ. They were no longer separated from God. They were no longer um, heading to, for judgment to hell. They were no longer under God's judgment and anger. The old had gone, the new had come. They were a new creation. Being in Christ has always been a great reason to celebrate as Paul and the ancient Christians did. And it must be the same for us today. Hallelujah, what a saviour. Are you rejoicing? If you are a Christian, are you rejoicing in what Christ has done? If so, say hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And then we note Paul's words at the end of his greetings to the Christians and the church. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. You see, were it not for God's grace, no one would ever have been saved. No one would ever become a Christian. And having experienced God's grace in their lives, Paul reminds them of the peace which they have through Jesus Christ. And that peace cannot be found in anything or anyone else. That peace which passes understanding. Paul's wish for the Colossians was that they would take hold of God's presence, of God's peace, of God's joy, because he is always with them. God is always with us. Remember that. We're never on our own as Christians. God is with us. He indwells us by his Holy Spirit. He has promised never to leave nor to forsake us. And knowing that God is with us, we will have that peace which he alone can give. And that peace is expressed in joy. Among the tragedies in our time is the pursuit of personal peace, of personal peace apart from God's grace, which brings about salvation. That pursuit takes many forms. It takes the form of seeking after material things. It can be intellectual, like the Gnostics, wanting to um, have that extra knowledge or think that we are able to earn and work out our own salvation. It can be money. People that believe they can find peace and joy in money or in drugs, in living contrary to the ways that God has set before us. But our mental institutions show that these things do not work. The unhappiness that we see all around us show the futility of seeking that peace and joy other than in the Lord Jesus Christ. For when sinners find peace through God's grace, that's beautiful. That is the cause for great rejoicing. And it is my prayer that each one here this morning has found that peace and joy and that you are celebrating that peace and joy because of all that Jesus Christ has done for you. Then there's also the celebration of thanksgiving, verses 3 to 5a. As Paul continued his greeting, he gratefully made reference to the familiar Christian trio, faith, hope, and, can't hear, charity or, what's the word, love, right. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that springs from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. Faith, hope, love. They are the definition of what it means to be a genuine Christian. You cannot be a Christian if you've never experienced faith, hope, and love. Paul first celebrated their faith in Christ Jesus. Faith is always mentioned first in the trio because apart from faith, there is no Christian experience. And this faith also is a free gift from God. It was Christ, it was Christ, Christ Jesus, in whom, uh, in whom we have faith, and that faith is given to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
for God by his grace has redeemed us and, uh, and saved us through Christ and the Holy Spirit gives us the faith to believe all that Christ has done so that he is our Lord and Saviour and King. And this is not your own doing. You haven't done that. You haven't come to that conclusion by yourself. It is all of grace. God gives faith to believe. It is not a result of works so that no one may boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Always remember, it is not faith that saves you. Faith does not save you. It is the work of Christ that saves you. The work of Christ upon the cross. Now, petrol is not the engine in the car, but the petrol makes the engine alive and enables the car to go. Faith is not salvation, but through God's gracious gift of faith, Christianity becomes alive in us and we can glorify God in our living. And friends, this is where many of us fail. We do not glorify God in our living. We do not live and show that Jesus Christ is our King, He's our Saviour, He is our Lord. We do not show the fruit of the Spirit in our lives that will attract others to come and seek and to learn more about Jesus. It is through God's gracious gift of faith that Christianity becomes alive in us. And I just want to um, put a little aside here. I must stress this because what do we often hear certain people say about faith? If it weren't for my faith, this would have happened. It was my faith that saved me. Wrong, wrong, wrong. These people wear faith as a lucky charm on a bracelet. If all of their other lucky charms don't work for them, well, they hope that their faith will. When someone says that he or she has faith, the question which must be asked is faith in what? Faith in yourself? Faith in Buddha? Faith in your good deeds? We are not saved because we believe. God doesn't need a hand to save us. Because we are saved, we believe. The Holy Spirit gives us the gracious gift of faith. Salvation comes by believing in Christ. When John G. Payton was translating the Bible in the Outer Hebrides, now known as Vanuatu, he searched for the exact word to translate believe. Finally, he found it. The word meant lean your whole weight upon. Lean your whole weight upon. That is what the Colossians, despite their Gnostic detractors, had done. Their salvation was founded in Christ Jesus and by faith they believed that Christ had died for them and they were saved. And that was something to celebrate and that's something that we need to celebrate. Paul then continued to praise the Colossians for the love they had for all the saints. You see, as the, um, the epistles of John tell us, that if we say we love God and then hate our brother or sister, then we are liars. Paul proved its reality that they had faith in God, that they were indeed saved. He proved that reality by the fact that they expressed their God's love in love for one another. Loving God is seen in how one loves his neighbour and particularly another believer. True faith is proven by how you love one another in the congregation. We've all met people who claim to be good Christians, who are upstanding, honest, and claim to believe the Bible, but their actions were unloving. Their words were unloving. And uh, we need to be very careful even in our own congregation. When we set ourselves apart and we only talk to certain people and not to anyone else, when we've got our own group, 
that can cause division? Is that showing that we really love one another every in each one of us? Or are we saying that we only love a certain group of people and we don't love that other group of people? The Bible says, no, loving each other, everyone, all of us, is a sign of true faith. It's a beautiful thing when you see Christians in the church all loving one another, not just some, not just those that are lovable, but loving all loving one another. And this is what made the early church so amazing and so inviting to the people outside. People from all nations, slave and free, male and female, Jew and Greek, the learned and the uneducated, the shepherds and the business people, all joined hands and prayed together and sat down at one table to celebrate the Lord's Supper. They were all one in Christ Jesus. People outside the church could not understand this. They became very suspicious when they saw such love being lived out by the Christians. In a way, they became jealous, and when you become jealous, you become nasty and mean, and so they accused the Christian of devil worship. And it's the same today. You know, when people do everything to oppose Christians, well, they're, of course, opposing God, I believe it's because they are jealous. They know that God has blessed us with something they don't have. and They lack power. They may sneak among themselves and say that um, Christians are this and that, but they know deep down that um, what they really want is what Christians do have. We must always remain true to God by living one, loving one another. A new thing had come into the world, a community held together by love, not because they lived in the same area, not because they were all of the one race, not because they all spoke the same language or because they belonged to the same tribe, but because they were in Christ. We can demonstrate that here. Different nationalities, all one in Christ loving one another and we, as we express the love of God in our lives. And praise God that there were those who, because they saw how Christians loved one another, <clears throat> became Christians also. And the Christians love one another, the Colossae, was cause for Paul's joyous celebration. Would Paul be able to celebrate our love for one another here at Gateway? Or would he see you turning away from another person or refusing to talk to a certain person? Would Paul see someone not accept a ride in a certain person's car? Would Paul see someone not entering the church to worship and going home because they saw a certain family or a person inside? Paul celebrates as he sees all in the church in Colossae loving one another. If we love the Lord Jesus... We will love one another, do we? And then Paul celebrated their hope, the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. How often do we think of heaven? How often do we remember that we are on a journey, that this world is not our home, that our journey will lead us, if we are Christians, into eternal glory, into heaven. Hope comes into our lives when we have faith and love. The Bible reminds us that this world is not our home. We are passing through. Peter calls it that we have a living hope, the new heaven and earth. As pagans, the Colossians had been without God and without hope in the world. Pagans, those who refuse to follow Jesus, they have no hope. They only have hell to look forward to. And this is what the pagans in Colossae had before them at one time. And then came the gospel brought to them by Paphos and Philemon and the wonderful, surprising joy of salvation and the hope of heaven became theirs. This hope encouraged them when things got tough. May that hope encourage us too when things get tough. 
When being persecuted for their faith, they knew that the enemy would never have the victory because no one could take away their hope of glory. They may take their lives, their money, but never their eternal life, their hope of glory. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. John 10, 27 to 28. Friends, how important this glory is. Paul tells us that the hope of the return of Christ and the heavenly reward will make a great big difference in our lives, in the way that we live, in the way that we think, in the way that we interact with one another. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness, no to worldly passions, no to lives that are self-controlled and not Christ-controlled. And it says yes to upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Dear friends, how important is the hope of glory to you? You just live for today, just live for today for worldly things, the next bill, the next new dress, or the next new big TV or whatever. Do you get annoyed when God makes you feel uncomfortable in the way you are living, especially when you hear the gospel, the word of God being taught and proclaimed, when you know very well that you are worshipping the gods and the idols of this world, that you're putting your trust in money, clothing and possessions rather than in the living hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, may our love for Christ be such that we will long for the hope of glory, that we will celebrate that hope of glory, never just living for the now, but always living for the glory of heaven. And then thirdly and very importantly, there was the celebration of the gospel. The apostles celebrated the gospel success all over the world. And that's still happening now. This gospel is producing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. 1 Colossians 1, verses 6 to 8. Here Paul was celebrating the dynamic power of the gospel and its universality, spreading throughout the world. It's not confined to one tribe. It's not confined to one nation. It's not confined to the Western world. It's not confined to the Eastern world. The gospel is universal. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, their hearts will be turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. Unlike the Gnostic elitist foolishness, Christ's good news was for everybody and is daily reaching new people. The miracle of the little church in Colossae in the Lycus Valley was cause for great celebration. It is our celebration too. For we are God's holy and faithful ones. We are God's saints. God has called us into his kingdom. He has adopted us into his eternal family. He has set us aside for his glory. And even before the foundation of the world, he has prepared good works for us to do, that we might go spiritually and that the kingdom of God will go physically. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, having God the Father as our common father. Let us love one another. Let us never separate ourselves into groups. Help us, ask God to help us to truly love one another, to work together. How are you serving God? Is, uh, is this your church? Are you claiming this is your church? Are you 
prepared to use what God has entrusted to you so that God's work can continue through this church. I'm not talking about being great evangelists. I'm talking about putting yourself even on, on the roster to clean the church, mow the lawn. These are all ways in which we can own the church and serve Christ and show our love for him. We are in Christ and have the wonderful promise of glory, the new heavens and the new earth. When was the last time you said to yourself, this is not my home? I've got a wonderful home to look forward to. My journey will take me to this glorious home. And as I journey, I want to show my love for Jesus. I want to use all that he has entrusted to me for his glory, for his honour, and be part of that mighty army going to war and bringing uh, many souls by the grace of God into his kingdom. Yes, friends, the grace of God has been freely poured upon us, grace upon grace. Nothing that we are, nothing that we want to do, we cannot do on our own. It is by the grace of God. And God pours that grace freely upon us that we are able to do great and wonderful things for him. We are able to celebrate God's love, God's hope, God's peace. We have peace, shalom, the well-being that results from divine grace in the presence of God. God has given us faith, hope, and love, faith in Christ, love for all the saints, hope stored, for, stored up for us in heaven. Friends, let us in joyful continuity with the Colossian church daily, not only celebrate the good news of abundance of life in Christ Jesus, but show it and live it to his honour and to God's glory. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we just thank you for the reminder um, that we have so much to celebrate. We have so much to be thankful for. Thank you, Father, that you have given us your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have suffered and died for us and risen again, that you will come again and receive unto yourself all who belong to you. Thank you for that hope. And thank you that you indwell us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you that all that we have has been given to us by your grace. It is not due to anything in us. Thank you, Father, that what we could not do, you've done for us. Help us daily to celebrate the salvation that has come to us through the power of the gospel, which, of course, is, a, is salvation to all who truly believe. Lord, help us to leave this place here this morning renewed, rejoicing. And as we rejoice, we will want to serve you. We will want to give as you've given to us. We want to use all that you've entrusted to us for your honour and for your glory for building us up spiritually to love you more and to build up your kingdom in number. Oh, Lord, hear our prayer in Jesus' name. As we sing our next hymn, um, you'll be waited upon for your tithes and free will offer. What a friend we have in Jesus.
Father, we again just praise and thank you for all your love for us, for your mercy and grace. We thank you that you've called us into your kingdom, that you've given us this eternal um, and living hope. We thank you for the love in Christ Jesus. Help us truly to love others. Thank you for that peace which passes all understanding, that despite all the storms that are going within us and around us, yet we are able to have that peace because you are with us and in your strength we are able to overcome. We are able to live to your glory. Thank you for the gift of money, the gift of possessions, the gift of time. Lord, all of this has been given to, to us by you. It's not ours, it belongs to you. And we are to use everything for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. Lord, forgive us when we've just given you the leftovers. Forgive us when we've not given to you the first fruits that you have entrusted to us. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will increase our love and so increase our giving. We pray your blessing upon what we have brought to you here this morning. Multiply it, Father, that truly it will be used um, for growing us as Christians to love you more and also for bringing others into your kingdom. And in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Father, we thank you that you promised to hear and to answer our prayers in accordance with your holy and gracious will. And yes, Father, we do pray for one another. Help us to love one another. Help us to work together for the glory of your name and for the extension of your kingdom. Lord, we see the mess that the world is in. We see it all around us. We see it in broken families. We see it in people addicted to this and to that. Father, we see it in the strife that goes on in society. We see it in the wars that are occurring throughout the world. Lord, how desperately we need that peace and joy, that salvation that comes in and through Christ. And we just pray, Father, for, for Christians everywhere that here we will be reminded that we are, in fact, missionaries um, to our suburb, to our neighbours, to those who live in our street. And so, Father, we pray for ourselves first and foremost that we will be missionaries going out in your name and wanting to make disciples, bringing the good news to many. We pray also for those who are missionaries beyond the, our borders, for those who have gone to other countries, often to dangerous situations. But we pray that as they preach the gospel, darkness will give way to light the, um, and that the kingdom of death will give way to the kingdom of life, that the kingdom of lies will give way to the kingdom of truth and that many will come to know Jesus and to follow him. Keep them safe, Lord, especially do we pray Christians in, in places such as China in the Middle East. We pray for Christians in Muslim-dominated countries. We think especially of the Christians in Nigeria who are being slaughtered left, right, and centre, and the government does and says nothing, and the world remains silent. Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones that they will know that you are with them and that you will be able to provide for their needs and lead them safely through this time of suffering. Father, we pray for Christians who have been forced into refugee camps um, because they were persecuted and hunted like animals. And we pray that here too their needs will be met. Help us, Lord, to be generous in, in supporting um, these people whenever we can. Father, we pray that for our church here that you will bless us and truly use us, be in the meeting, that we will hear you speaking to us, son, daughter, you love me, I love you. How will you show that love? We pray for those who are not well. We think of the Agaluri household and we ask, that your healing power would be upon them. For Sylvia, Lord, that she would even now be feeling a lot better. 
that Carl would be completely healed and that others who we name in our hearts, that, Lord, you'll be with them also. Thank you that with you all things are possible. And Lord, we just pray that as we continue into this new year that you'll give us a vision, a vision of what we are able to do in your strength and in your power so that it all will be to your honour and glory. And we pray for our nation, we pray for our leaders, and we just ask, Father, that you'll raise up more and more Christians who will um, lead our nation into the way of truth and justice and righteousness. Lord, hear these our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. God is with us. That's the mighty claim.
God bless you.